So my name is uh, Raghavan. I am a faculty member here at IMSC. Um, I am supposed to be doing some algebra, uh, cover some material from algebra. Vijay Kodialam, who is also a faculty member here, he, you know, he and I are sharing the algebra part. I will give one hour, there are three slots, so I will give, I will take, I will, uh, I will be your speaker for one hour and he will be for uh, two of the slots, okay. So uh, originally he was scheduled to speak this morning and uh, um, um, but since he has not, um, um, our uh, topics are fairly independent but there was a small uh, overlap, uh, however I will since he has not spoken I will try to make allowance for that, okay. So, so the topic I am going to be speaking about is called factorization. And um, so I suppose all, all of you are familiar with this uh, text Artin's algebra, okay. So so most of what I am going to speak is uh, from Artin's uh, chapter 11, okay. I do not know, would you, do you teach uh, from Artin? First time. First time. time, okay. To, um, well, this is, uh, I would advise using this um, book also as a reference uh, for your students and uh, it is definitely different, very differently written uh, than from, I don't know, the style is very different from Herstein's. Um, Okay, and <coughs> so let us begin with, I um, will be speaking about uh, three or four items. So the first one, so I ask you the following. So uh, finding the HCF, the highest common factor of two integers. I mean this might seem very trivial to you. But let me ask you, suppose I give you these two numbers, just for example, some large numbers, how would you find their HCF? How would you go about doing that? Okay. Suppose you wanted to prime factorize and do it. So one is st uh, method one, let us call it, do prime factorization. Right, and then you can write down if it is if this one is, of course, p1, a1, p2, a2, and pr, ar, and the other one also I can write as p1, b1, p2, b2. Maybe some of these primes don't divide this other one. If they don't divide, I take this as zero, right? P r. So I can assume without loss of generality, allowing the bi's and the a's to be possibly zero, that the primes are the same, and then the HCF is p1 to the minimum of a1, b1, pr to the minimum of ar, br, okay, okay, that is good. But suppose I give you 100 digit long two numbers, ask you to find their HCF this way, how, um, how long will it take to do it? Will you be able to do it? I mean, or how do you write it? Suppose I want you to write a computer program to find the. So you will write a computer program to factorize, but that won't. That even on a very good machine, <coughs> it will get stuck. Okay. So either we are forced to the conclusion that if I give you, <coughs> say, hundred-digit long numbers, you can't find the HCF easily, or that there is perhaps a 
more efficient method. Yes. So the other method, let me remind you, I'm sure you know this, is the, yeah, so one, okay, so what the model of the story therefore is, um, one thing that you could incorporate, particularly these days into your teaching, is uh, algorithms. How actually you, you know, that, that, that's a theoretically a pretty good, uh, uh, you know, way of checking that it's safe and it works very well for small numbers, right? But the point is the, the, the Euclid's algorithm for finding, divisional algorithm for finding the HCF, that is something which is computationally uh, much better because even if the numbers are very big, you will very soon, you know, it, if you program it into a computer, I, I'm sure any small computer will run that program and give you the answer very quickly, okay? So uh, in terms of what they call um, computational time required, this is almost impossible to do, whereas that one is very easy to do, okay? So that is uh, something to keep in mind. So uh, su suppose we are trying to find, or for example, you are trying to diagonalize a matrix or something like this, all these, uh, what is an algorithm to do it? Can I write a computer program to do it? And, uh, and how, how fast is the algorithm? How good is the algorithm? Okay, these are aspects that you might want to think about. Okay, so let us do, um, uh, I mean, th this is already too big, so let's just go ahead and write So let's, suppose I give you, I mean, for example, I could do that, but that's too big to do on the board. So let me do 43 and 91. Let us find the HC of these two numbers. So how do you do this? So I take 91, take the, so let me write the, systematically let me write 91, right? Then 43 is lesser than that. So what I do is I divide this by 43. So that gives me 2 as quotient and 5 as remainder, right? So I take this 5 and put it there. So then I take the 43, divide by 5, get quotient 8 and remainder 3. So I put 3, right? And then I take 5, divide by 3, I get remainder 2, okay? And then finally I put 2 and 3 and I get remainder 1. So 1, 1. So and then I put 2 and 1, I get 0. So the next one is 0, right? 0, 0. The remainder is 0. So the, what Euclid's algorithm says is that this last number, last non-zero number here is the HCF, right? Okay. Okay. Here is another thing that um, so, um, so we it's so. Let's look at the definition of HCF. Can you give me a definition of HCF, the highest common factor? It is. It divides both, and then thing divides it. Then that divides this. Okay. Correct. So that's the usual definition of HCF, highest common factor. That's what it means, right? Okay. So here is another uh, another way of looking at the HCF is the following. So A and B are so A and B are my given numbers. The HCF notation is this, right? That is, if A and B are integers, the HCF is denoted A comma B. So I could look at A x plus B y, the set as x and y, x and y vary over all integers. Right? I could do this. Now, I claim, and this is easy to see, that this is an ideal in the ring of integers. What does an ideal mean? So maybe you can recall for me the definition of an ideal. When do you call something an ideal? So it's a subset of a ring. Okay, you call it an ideal if it is non-empty, and it is closed under 
additive subgroup, yes, additive subgroup, and multiplicatively, what property should it have? So, if I take some element there and multiply it by any element of the ring, it should come in there. Okay. So, of course, if the, if your ring is non-commutative, then you can have left ideal and right ideal and things like this. But since in a commutative ring, uh, the right or left do, won't won't make a difference. So, you call something an ideal if it must be an additive subgroup, it must be non-empty, it must be closed under addition, and whenever you take an element of this subset, multiply it by any element of the ring, it should come into that subset. Okay. Now, this set, this is a set of integers, has that property. Right? If I have Ax plus By, another number Ax prime plus By prime, then if I add them, it is A, or A times X plus X prime plus b y plus y prime. So, that is also of this form. Further, if I multiply this by an integer say m, then I get a m x plus b m y. Well, think of m x as some other x and m y as some other y and surely that is, so this is an ideal, right. Okay. And what do we know about ideals in, um, ideals in uh, integers? What does an ideal in the ring of integers look like? It is of the form 2z, 3z, 4z, etc. It must be multiples of a given number, right. So, it is multiples of the some given number, right. So, this is equal to so mz, so, uh, MZ for some m. Okay. I can even say for some unique m bigger than or equal to 0. So, if it is 5 z of course, I can write minus 5 z as well, but if I make if I insist that that number be non 0 uh, non negative it might be 0 1 2 3 or 4 then that is unique also right. Okay. What do you think the relation between m and the HCF is? they are equal. So, this m is nothing but a b. Okay, that is a slightly abstract way of defining the HCF. So, what you do is you take this set, observe that it is an ideal and it therefore, it must be of the form of some integer times multiples of an integer and that integer if I assume it to be positive it is unique and that unique number is the HCF. Okay. This is another and it is easy to check that indeed that number is the HCF. Okay, Let us do it. So, I claim this divides A and this divides B. right? Why? Why is that? Everything here is a multiple. If I put y equal to 0, x equal to 1 I get A. A belongs here. So, A is a multiple of A B. B similarly I put x equal to 0, y equal to 1 I get B. So, B belongs here which means it is a multiple of A B. So, A B divides B. Okay. Now, suppose something divides A and divides B, it divides <coughs> everything this side, but A B belongs here. So, it divides A B. Correct? So, it is easy to see that indeed that number must be the HCF. I've, so, there is this definition of the HCF, that is one definition. This is another definition, if you wish another and, and it is easy to see that the two definitions are the same equivalent. Okay. But this brings us to another important point and that is the following. It means in particular that look at this a b belongs to this set right which means a b must you must be able to write a b as a x plus b y for some x and y right. So, what this means is we can always we can solve we can find integers hmm, 
not necessarily positive x and y such that a x plus b y is equal to a b right that is what it says this is a theoretical statement okay. Now let us go back and look at this example 43 91 and 43 are my a and b and what is their HCF it is 1. So there must in part okay so I must get 40 91 times x plus 43 times y must be equal to 1 I must solve that how do you explicitly do that all we know right now is that there exist x and y such that this holds how do you actually go and find x and find y how do you do this this again you should see that there, so no either this definition or this definition they only tell us that there exists a solution right how do you actually go and solve it so this is some you know uh, there is this aspect of mathematics that we probably overlook uh, but it is about time we rectified that and gave as much emphasis to actually doing solving things pardon me yeah we sort of take it for granted but how do you actually solve it suppose I you can actually do that right now if I ask you to solve this how would you go about doing it it looks hopeless right I mean if you have to just do you know blindly search for numbers right the key again lies in the Euclidean algorithm okay now all you need to do I will show you how to solve this by just you know looking backwards in this so what does this so what I do is I first write 1 as a multiple of 2 and 3 then I will write 2 as a multiple of 3 and 5 and then I will write 3 as a multiple of 5 and, and so on and finally I will you know when I substitute backwards I get my solution okay once again the see the, uh, I am say, so the second reason why you should definitely do the Euclidean algorithm in your courses is one that it is a much faster way of computing the I mean it is it is the sort of the oldest perhaps the oldest way it is a much better way than this prime factorization way okay for reasons of compute uh, for uh, f speed of computation second thing is a thing like this if you do not have the Euclidean algorithm uh, you know just from theoretical um, considerations it is not possible to uh, so I mean I, I mean maybe there are other ways but the uh, one good the Euclidean algorithm definitely gives you a way to do it so let us do it so I write if you look back I write 1 as 3 minus 2 right okay now what does this tell me is 5 minus 3 right so I substitute for 2 is equal to 3 minus 5 minus 3 so I expand that now that is minus 5 plus 2 times 3 thank you I write like that okay now I look at uh, 3 right 3 is 43 minus 8 times 5 so I substitute that so this is equal to minus 5 plus 2 times 43 minus 8 times 5 okay so I will erase this part of the board now. okay so let us write that out so how much is that minus 16 so it is minus 17 times 5 plus 2 times 43 correct and now I take that 5 and write it as 43 and 91 so minus 17 and 5 this gives me 5 is equal to 91 minus 2 times 43 so 
91 minus 2 times 43 is equal to 2 times uh, sorry plus 2 times 43. So if I do that it gives me minus 17 times 91 and then plus 34 plus 2 plus 36 times 43. So easy right and those numbers are fairly big minus 17 and 36 this if you did it by trial and error if even for numbers like 91 and 43 it would take a long time for you to do it right besides it you know yeah yeah so there are these advantages okay okay now the next topic uh, so much for the HCF uh, although it will make an appearance in the next one too. So let us talk about the Chinese reminder theorem. So uh, the other uh, sort of uh, general principle I want to uh, convey to you is so um, when we study uh, ring theory is a topic that you teach in uh, uh, BSc or MSc level I assume um, yeah so um, I would say uh, rather than teach it quite abstractly there are two sort of uh, subjects from which ring theory grew and these have uh, these continue to be sort of the sources uh, they are the source for uh, both the uh, the root as well as the fruit if you so, so to speak because so they are the, both the source for the the reason the motivation for studying ring theory and also uh, where the applications are namely one is arithmetic or number theory like what we did okay uh, and we are going to do a little more of that the other is geometry okay so uh, what you might call analytic geometry okay and more uh, slightly more advanced level it will become algebraic geometry okay so uh, so the, these can be taught as part of ring theory okay so when you do ring theory um, say Lagrange's theorem or something like this then a good thing to keep in mind is that uh, for example when you um, do group theory uh, you know always keep the example of z mod pz star the units in z mod pz or the units in z mod nz these are examples of groups okay uh, so continuing you know so uh, so let us talk about the Chinese remainder theorem this again you might this uh, this uh, is a theorem in ring theory if you wish but really it comes from arithmetic or number theory okay. So uh, do you know the statement of this no okay so maybe you have forgot maybe you have seen it I am sure you have seen it but you have forgotten never mind. Yes. Yeah. So you are on the right track. So yeah, correct. So here the, the that's correct. What you want to do is solve simultaneous congruences. This is, I mean, if you want to say it shortly, it is so. So here is some. Let's take this particular example. Okay. Suppose I give you, I want to solve for x. So let's understand this in terms of an explicit example so I so I want you to give me an integer which has the following properties that it is 2 mod 5 what does that mean it gives me remainder 2 when I divide by 5 so what is the set of solutions to this it would be 2 7 12 or minus 3 minus 8 and so on right that is a solution to this congruence now suppose I put one more congruence 3 mod 7 okay how do you solve this so what you would do is look for this list and then 3 mod 7 list right and then 3 mod 7 would be 3 10 17 etc and somewhere hopefully you would hit a that there would be a common element here it would be say 17 would do it would do the job right 
but suppose I give you one more and there is no need to I mean there is no reason to stop with 3 I could go on and on I give you that for example right so question is this can you solve this and if you can find a solution so how do you do this is the question and as a matter aside let me say um, perhaps the, the I mean see you do normally do not think of this you have studied partial fractions right in or uh, I mean normally we have forgotten about that since we do not teach in 12th standard but uh, partial fractions is nothing but Chinese remainder theorem it's just it's just that okay normally we don't say it that way we'll say so you know find partial fractions but that is really the theoretical basis for that is the chinese remainder theorem okay of course not with the, not in integers but in the polynomial ring in one variable okay but anyway but for now let us try to solve this how do you go about doing that okay so the first so statement is so here is this it has to do with this so let me make the statement here c so crt chinese remainder theorem if n1 n2 nk are pairwise co prime integers what does that mean for every pair not of course if you take the whole thing it might be one without every pair being there may be some common factor between two two of them what we are saying is no two of them have a common factor they are pairwise co prime okay co prime integers uh, and c1 c2 ck are any integers or arbitrary integers then there exists a solution I mean an integral solution to x is congruent to c1 mod n1 congruent to c2 mod n2 you can solve this that is the first statement second statement is what is the set of all solutions uh, so if x naught is a solution then the set of all solutions is x naught plus m times n1 nk m is in z surely observe that everything here is a solution because if I take if x naught is a is some solution and I add some multiple of n1 to nk through it and if I if I take the say I just take m equal to 1 x naught plus that and if I check modulo n1 this n1 divides this so it gives me the same remainder as x0 which is c1 and similarly for n2 and so on okay surely these are all solutions if x0 is a solution anything of that form is also a solution so the, the claim is lies in that those are the only solutions there is no other possible solution okay so that is the statement but never mind uh, 
uh, never mind the uniqueness part, meaning the, by the uniqueness I mean you can state this as it is unique modulo n1 through nk. That's, on a, that's just a way of saying it. But let us look at the existence part and try to solve it. And in fact, let's concentrate on this particular example because once we know how to do this example, you will see the pattern and you will see how to write up the proof for the general case. Okay? And um, okay, so I'll erase this, but remember this this will be uh, important for us. Okay, one thing you could do when you are stuck with a problem is try to make the problem simpler and try to you know try a version of the problem which is maybe simple, right? So instead of 2, 3, 4, I could take suppose I take 0, 0 and 2 here or even 1. Right? After all that says I must be able to solve it for any C1, Ck. Okay? So let us let us take 0, 0 and 1. Okay? So what I try to do is so let x1, let me call it x1, this won't be my x. So I am trying to solve a slightly different problem which will help hopefully help me do this one. So what I want is I want it 1 modulo 5, it should be 0 modulo 7 and 0 modulo 11. I know but suppose I, I will even make it 1 huh? because once I know the solution to this what do I have to do get to get 2 modulo 5? I just multiply it by 2, I will get 2 mod 5, right? So suppose I want to do this. Now you see it must be 0 mod 7, it must be 0 mod 11. So it must be 0 mod 77, right? Correct? Because 11 and 7 have no common factor. So, so, so this means that x1 is 0 mod 77, right? And the condition given to me is 5 has no common with factor with 7, it has no common factor with 11 which means I can 5 and 77 are as in this case but more generally in the given the hypothesis they are co-prime. So their HCF is 1. So I can solve such that AX plus 5X plus yes. So I can solve for 5X1 say or 77Y1 or let us call it this is equal to 1, I can solve this, right? Now if I look at this solution, look at this number, it is divisible by 77 and it is 1 modulo 5, okay? So what I need to do therefore to solve this is just go through my procedure for 77 and 5. Right? Write out the Euclidean algorithm. Okay? So let us okay. uh, let us quickly do that. 77 and 5. Let us go. So that will give me how much is that? 75. 15 and 2. And then 2 and 5. It gives me 2 and 1. So that is 77, 5, 2, 1, and then 0. Right? So I can write 1 as. So working backwards is 5 minus 2 times 2 and that 2 I can write as 5 minus 77 minus 15 times 5. So I get 16 times 5 minus 2 times 77, right? So the answer to this is 16. 5 times 16 minus 144 equals 1, right? So the solution I want here is this one, minus 144 is divisible by 7, it is divisible by 11 
and it is 1 modulo 5 it is minus 144 so it gives me minus minus uh, 4 modulo 5 which is 1 modulo 5 right when I yeah Ah, did I make a mistake? Aha. Uh -huh. Ah, okay. Sorry. Sorry. 31 into 5. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> 31. Thank you. Okay? Yeah. So minus 1. So the answer here, x1, the solution to this is minus 144. Right? So all you need to do is multiply these other numbers together right so what i do is i break up the problem i want to solve five. okay look at this i want to solve get c1 modulo n1 c2 modulo n2 ck modulo nk right what i do is i will say 0 modulo n2 n3 n4 nk and 1 modulo n1 suppose i try to do that the answer is you take n2 n3 nk multiply all of them with n1 its gcd will be 1 and therefore you can use the euclidean algorithm and write get a solution to something times n1 plus something times n2 n3 nk so on is equal to 1 and that product what you have something times n2 n3 nk will be a solution to 0 modulo n2 nk and 1 modulo n1 right so you have a solution to that similarly you will have a solution to play the game with n1 you know 1 modulo n2 and 0 modulo the rest and so on so on okay since they are pairwise co-prime you will you can use and now what do I do I the answer therefore is c1 x1 plus c2 x2 plus ck xk will be the answer because x1 what property does it have xj is congruent to 0 mod n i if if i is not equal to j and 1 modulo n j right if i take x1 it is 1 it's 1 modulo uh, n1 and 0 modulo the rest so if i multiply that by c1 what will i get it will have the property c1 x1 will have the property that it is 0 modulo uh, all the others and it is c1 modulo n1 now what does c2 x2 will have c2 x2 will be x2 is 0 modulo n1 0 modulo n3 0 modulo n4 so c2 x2 will also be 0 modulo all the rest except for 2 where x2 is 1 modulo n2 c2 x2 will be c2 modulo n2 so this is so if I take modulo n2 for example this is 0 this all the rest will be 0 this will give me c2 which is what I want if I take modulo c x n1 then all these will be 0 this will give me c1 and for modulo nk xk will be 1 ck xk therefore will be ck therefore this will give me ck and all these will give me 0 so that will be the solution okay you can actually now go ahead and do this uh, problem for want of time i will not finish it but the answer is for example 367 plus mz so this is the answer so it's it's not quite easy to find that answer if you um, if you if i mean i could just put on two more numbers there I mean 5 modulo 13 and 6 modulo 19 or something and then you will be uh, unless you had some procedure to do it uh, it would be quite difficult to do it okay. So uh, this is one um, other place so um, okay now let us come to um, I want to give a I want to talk about Gauss's lemma.
so, so uh, let us recall again. So far, I have tried to make two points. One is that try to look at algorithms whenever possible. Secondly, that when you, if you do teach ring theory, do keep in mind, you know, number theory and uh, geometry as the two sources and the two and also the sources of applications for the, the subject. Okay, so we should keep a constant uh, eye on those two subjects for sources of examples and sources of uh, applications. Okay, so there is a version of Chinese remainder theorem in ring theory which you might at some point teach, but really it is it it comes from uh, this, and the reason why it is called Chinese remainder theorem is um, because apparently the Chinese knew how to solve this uh, uh, long ago, and uh, of course, they would state it as, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can't do it right away off the, you know, from a standing start, but, uh, you know, there were so many sheep which, you know, so many cows and so many, and, you know, and uh, it was posed very picturesquely, the problem. Okay, now let's, uh, the next topic I want to talk about is Gauss's lemma. Okay, so do you remember the statement of Gauss's lemma? I mean, maybe there are many statements which are all called Gauss's lemma, but any one version. You, uh, perhaps you don't teach this in your courses, your algebra courses. Okay, so here is a. Okay, let's so let me state a one version which is easy to understand but which sort of looks only like a curiosity maybe okay and that is the following so so you understand this notation right so what does z stand for the ring of integers and when you write like that it is the polynomial ring in one variable or with integral coefficients right okay x is supposed to be an indeterminate so let's make a definition so I take f in here. So f is of the form some a naught x n or a n x n plus a n minus one x n minus one plus a naught something like that. Right is primitive. So this is a definition. If the common highest common factor of the coefficients is 1 okay so for example if i give you 35x cubed plus 27x square plus 8 is this primitive yes because i take the highest common factor of 35 27 and 8 it's one, okay. So, an example of a so just put a minus. So that's an example of a non-primitive uh, polynomial. Okay, is the definition clear? Okay, and the statement then is it's a very simple-looking statement. It says the following: If I multiply two primitive polynomials, the product is also primitive. So the statement is, so I can write it here. The product of primitive polynomials is primitive. Right? Statement is clear, right? So if I multiply two primitive polynomials, then the product must also be primitive. If I take the HCF of all the coefficients that I get in the product, take their HCF, 
I, I mean, take all the coefficients, take the rate safe, I still get 1. That is a claim. Okay, and how do you prove this? Okay, in a, for example, in Hurstein, the following proof will be given. You know, you, you actually make the computer, you know, sort of make the computation. If, you know, suppose P, you choose a prime which divides all the coefficients and then you write out something. Okay, but if you, the, the reason why I chose this is I was hoping that you would know the statement and the proof from Hurstein. But I would try to give you a slightly different proof. Okay, so, well, you, you can go back and look up the proof in Hurstein, but I am going to give you a slightly different proof. And you know, somehow the standard textbook, many standard textbooks, shy away from giving this following proof, which is really the most natural proof. And the proof is just one line. Okay, the proof is just one line, and it is as follows. A model of fact which I am sure all of you will accept. So the the model is you look at this proof, go back and see Hurstein's proof, compare and decide for yourself which you like better. Okay. So so proof. Okay. Let so let f comma g be primitive be primitive okay now let's do it by contradiction although you might you could possibly arrange the proof in such a way that the contradiction contradiction proof goes away but never mind so so suppose fg is not primitive we will try and arrive at a contradiction. Okay. Suppose, so fg is not primitive, assume that p a prime divides all coefficients of fg, right. fg is not primitive means what? The highest common factor is not 1, which means it is some number. I take one prime divisor of that number and that will surely divide all the coefficients. So if fg is not primitive, I am assured of a prime which divides all the coefficients. Okay. Now what I do is the following. So read so this is all that this is the, the proof is the following following phrase read modulo p that's the proof that's the one line proof right this is the key what it, what it means is the following so what does read modulo p mean see for formally if i have one ring and another ring and a homomorphism from one to the other I can always think of, so for example, Z is a ring, it is sitting inside say the complex numbers and the inclusion is a ring homomorphism, right. And so I can think of any polynomial with integer coefficients also as a polynomial uh, with complex coefficients, right. The, the, that does, you know, even if, for, for example, I can do this also with Z mod PZ, there is a ring homomorphism here. Namely, I can just go to the residue clause mod, meaning the, the remainder modulo p. So I take a number, just read it modulo p means take the remainder when I divide by p. That is a ring homomorphism. So any polynomial here, I can also regard as a polynomial here. If I read fg modulo p, what do I get? all the coefficients are divisible by p therefore i get zero so let us call let me put a bar here to, so to indicate that is in zp in so this this lives in and so 
I look at this integer po polynomial in z as a polynomial in z mod p x. All the coefficients vanish, so the polynomial must be zero. On the other hand, this is just the same as f bar g bar. If I read f modulo g modulo and then multiply, that is the same as multiplying and then going modulo. Okay, but now z mod p z is a field as you know very well, and if I adjoin a poly one variable to a polynomial, I mean put to a field, I get a integral domain, which means this must be zero or this must be zero, which means p must divide, right? One of the two. Okay, so since z mod p z is a field, z mod p z x is an integral domain, which means you can cancel. It has no zero divisors. So, so I'll erase this. So, either f bar equals zero or g bar equals zero. That is, so in which case, so which means p divides all the coefficients of f exactly, or p divides all the coef all coefficients of g. This would mean f is not primitive in particular and this means g is not primitive and that is the proof. Okay? It is a, so it is really you know it, it goes it has a famous name attached to it the lemma name is Gauss's lemma but really it is and he was um, um, I mean, not, uh, it's not for nothing because um, he was the first one who. Um, so, sort of understood the importance of this statement, okay? Um, but the proof is really just this, okay? Um, unfortunately, not all textbooks, elementary textbooks, uh, like Hurstein, do give this uh, proof, and I think it's. Um, I mean, Hurston is a very nice book. I have, you know, overall it's a very, very good book, very enjoyable. I'm not denying that. Nevertheless, somehow a proof like this is much more. Uh, I would be when I see a proof like this, it's much more attractive than the proof that is normally given, which is a long, laborious, uh, you know, which in fact amounts to just the same thing written in a much more complicated way. Okay, what it involves is this. You have to you have to sort of take this uh, reading modulo p and the product. You go modulo and then multiply, or multiply and go modulo. Those two are the same. That's one thing to be observed. And the fact that this is a field, therefore, this is an integral domain. Okay. All these are important facts. All these were simple facts to check. But modulo these facts, the proof is really very. It's read modulo p. Okay. Another uh, um, proof in the same category. And is the following. It is um, called Eisenstein's criterion for the irreducibility of a polynomial. Have you seen this? You don't remember, but maybe you've seen this. Okay. So here again, um, okay, I'm just wondering what to do in the next five minutes. I will not be able to do everything that I had in mind. Um, okay, Perhaps in Gauss's lemma, I will make one more, um, one more comment. Namely, uh, see this is the statement of Gauss's lemma. It looks attractive enough, but I feel it suffers from something. Namely, uh, it looks just like a curiosity. Right? Okay, product of two primitive polynomials is primitive. So what? Right? It's a nice statement, okay, fine, but what does it lead to? 
Okay. So really Gauss was interested in this because uh, of the there are other ways of stating this or th this is the main uh, remember that this is a lemma this is not a theorem okay this is the main technical ingredient of of a statement which is which he was interested in namely he wanted to say that he, if i had a, a, an irreducible polynomial over the integers it continues to be irreducible in q of x as a, as a rational polynomial it continues to be irreducible this was one of the so uh, the theorem really is and uh, the point I want to make is there is no point in trying to say the lemma without stating the the theorem okay really Gauss was interested in it because he was interested in what do irreducibles look like properties of irreducibles irreducible polynomials over z okay so uh, an irreducible polynomial in zx is also is irreducible as well over qx okay and another statement which is done in the in the same uh, breath is this ring polynomial ring in one variable over z is a unique factorization domain meaning you can write you know the usual statement about uh, factorizing prime factorization holds uh, to be more precise any element can be written as a product of prime powers would be the uh, statement in the integers here you would say as a product of irreducibles and then if I had another uh, factorization then after possibly a permutation I can align them so that the irreducibles are associates of each other that is one is no different from the other it is the same as the other up to a unit okay so uh, or more generally you can even prove if R is a UFD then so is Rx. So for example Zx if I had joined 10 variables to the ring of integers that would continue to be a UFD because I can apply this repeatedly okay. So, so the point I want to make here is sometimes uh, uh, suppose you are going uh, you know there is no point in making this statement without making these two okay so um, okay so uh, now let me come to Eisenstein's criterion here again um, let me state up I will state uh, this is normally stated for uh, integral polynomials so the statement let me re recall for you is suppose I have a polynomial with integer coefficients and suppose I have a prime p which divides uh, so so something okay take let's take something like this for example okay I have a prime uh, let, let me make this 6 just one I have a prime namely here 2 that divides all the it is a monic polynomial let us say monic means one leading coefficient is 1 suppose it divides all the uh, coefficients uh, uh, not one but the rest and suppose the square of the prime p square does not divide the constant term here 4 does not divide this then this is irreducible in as a uh, in zx that is the statement okay and uh, it can often be applied to um, uh, for example you can prove um, what is called the cyclotomic polynomial um, 
you can use this to prove the irreducibility of the cyclotomic polynomial after a substitution etc. Okay that is the statement. Um, once again if you look at the proof it will be some you know um, some long winded thing again you can use the same idea read modulo p to prove this. So, so prove reading modulo p and uh, Artin's book gives a proof in the in this way and it is much easier if you just read modulo p it is much easier ok. Let me take maybe 5 or a little more than 5 minutes of your time mm. and now introduce to you to some bit of geometry associated with this Eisenstein's criteria ok. So, this last bit is a just a to see how geometric ideas are involved in ring theory ok and it is a, a you could bring them up as follows as Artin does um, this is how he tries to prove the Eisenstein's criterion for example a geometric proof or a geometric visualization of Eisenstein's criteria. So, the statement is the following. So, let f t x be an l minus 1 t x to the n minus 1 plus so on plus a naught t. So, this time the it is I think of it as a polynomial in x with coefficients coming from coefficients being polynomials in t ok. Suppose that so I write out an analogous you know uh, a condition that looks like Eisenstein's criteria that is suppose that t divide t does not divide a and t. So, this is like saying the first one is monic, but really it is just good enough to say t does not divide right that means the constant term here of this polynomial is non zero t divides all the others a n minus 1 t a n a 0 t and t square does not divide a 0 t ok those are analogous conditions and then he says then if these conditions are satisfied then f t x is irreducible in this polynomial ring. Ah, ok. So, I should make here. Uh, so, uh, so let me put one more condition here. Just uh, this is like saying, uh, I mean, this is okay. assume that A and T a 0 t equals 1. So, that is you can see these polynomials these are polynomials in one variable they are HCF there is no common factor among those ok. Assume that I mean if it if there is you can always pull it out and you know keep it aside and make f smaller. So, this is really no condition at all. So, let us understand I look at it geometrically. So, so this is the t axis, this is the x axis, right. Suppose I try to graph. So, I look at w, what he calls w is this set of solution all those points where this is 0 right ok. Now, when I put so I try to find this out. So, I if I look at if I put the point I wo he wants to make is suppose I put I look at this right. Suppose I put t equal to 0 what do I get? f of 0 x a n 0 which is some non zero constant 
t does not divide a and t all these are zero right so it is some so it is a n 0 x to the n right so if I put t equal to 0 and try to solve the, and, and try to see for which values of x this is 0 the only value is x equal to 0 because this is non 0 so the to be for this to be 0 I get only x equals 0 which means so this will be some curve in general and the only point on this curve which cuts this line is this right okay now suppose f was equal to g h again by contradiction suppose it was not irreducible I was able to write f as g times h where these had some these were degree of x degree was bigger than or equal to 1 degree of x in h was bigger than or equal to 1 right these were polynomials with non-zero degrees in x which multiply give you f then you can look at f bar equal to g bar h bar where now bar means read modulo t okay now what is f bar modulo t it is a n 0 x n right so and this is the factorization of a n 0 x n in c of x so once I go go once I put t equal to 0 I get this polynomial and it, it factorizes thus which means notice that g bar and h bar are of the also of the form something times x to the sum power h bar is also something to so what I conclude from this is that g bar is equal to some constant times cr and h bar is equal to some constant times in fact n minus r okay where r r is bigger than or equal to 1 and n minus r is bigger than or equal to 1 okay so when I so the point so there are two points to be made so if I if I want to look at this locus f equal to 0 that consists of so if I put f equal to 0 I get g h equal to 0 which means either g equal to 0 or h equal to 0 so the locus of f equal to 0 is really the union of the loci g equal to 0 and the loci h equal to 0 that is the first point that comes from this second is further when I put t equal to 0 the this locus also just goes through the origin and this locus also goes through the origin okay so what I get from that is so I mean you know you can say some picture like this so um, let me see if I have a different color uh oh so you can say this is g equal to 0 and this is h equal to 0 okay now the conclusion therefore what you get is that see g of h g goes through the origin h also goes through the origin so from this you can conclude that if i compute del f by del t at the origin and if I compute del f by del x at the origin they are both 0 okay why is this let us just see this and it's, this is similar okay because of because of this what is del f by del t del f by del t is equal to del g by del t h plus g del h by del t and when I substitute the origin here h at the origin is 0 here g at the origin is 0 so del f by del t at the origin is 0 del f by del x at the origin is 0 but I claim that contradicts this okay so let us see why 
Delef. Um, if I compute del f by del t at 0, 0, what do I get? So there is x to the n here. So there is some derivative of this times x to the n, but I am putting x equal to 0. So all this is 0, but a naught t, right? The, the, the del f by del t, if I do this, here I know that t square does not divide a naught t. So what form does a naught t have? t divides a naught. So a, so a naught t will look like something. So this is a naught t will look like 0 and the constant term, higher terms, plus something here, some some number here, okay, call it uh, C and D maybe I have used E, E not equal to 0. This is how it will look. So when I take del f by del t, this will give me E plus some polynomial, but I am going to put t equal to 0 in that. So this gives me only E, right? So this is equal to this E that is coefficient of t in A naught t, which is not 0 by assumption because t square does not divide a naught t. So that is a contradiction. Okay. So uh, I mean I did this because I mean okay it was maybe a little fast but the point is there is some geometry associated there is either arithmetic there is on the one hand arithmetic and on the other hand geometry associated with ring theory and um, we should keep these two always constantly in the mind. If we do, then uh, uh, we can make the subject more uh, interesting and uh, enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.